Hi True Crime family, I'm Manju and welcome back to my channel where we talk about true crime cases from around the world. Today we are going to be traveling to Nova Scotia, Canada and talking about a pretty well-known Canadian case. It's about a family who had over 100 years of incest and was excluded from the rest of society. Disclaimer, we will be talking about sexual abuse with children and incest. The Goler family was a poor family. They lived in a rural part of South Nova Scotia in a community called White Rock outside the town of Wolfville where they were excluded and not bothered by the outside world in two shack-like homes. Their living area was pretty run down with dirty windows, garbage everywhere outside, long grass, old cars and bikes scattered all around outside and on the inside it was smelly, there were flies everywhere, it's according to the officers it smelled like a sewage and they didn't have any running water or a bathroom and the entire Goler family was known to keep to themselves and distance themselves from normal life per se. They supported themselves by fishing, hunting, looking for berries, and collecting social welfare checks and doing the odd labor job at a nearby farm. The chores at home were done by children, such as searching for food, preparing the food, and removing the trash. Now, children all over the world help their parents and do chores at home. However, for the Goler family, the kids would take all the garbage and throw it up in the attic until it was completely filled. And, and then they would take all the garbage from the attic and throw it outside in their front lawn. Now the Goler family did live a poor life. They didn't have a bathroom like previously stated, they didn't have running water, and the children had to share beds, which were just mattresses on the floor. Now the townspeople nearby knew of the Goler clan and how poorly they lived, but they always kept away, and being called a Goler was an insult, so they would use that name as an insult. Which was especially hard for the Goler kids who went to school with the regular children because they would get bullied. It's surprising that a family who has been so private and kept to themselves for generations would send their children to school with the townspeople's children. But I guess it was so that they could keep the charade and collect the social welfare checks to prove to the government that yes, we have kids and we're sending them to school and we're taking them to doctors and we're looking after them and we need money for that. Now, as humans, from birth, we're kind of wired in a way that we know certain things are just plain wrong, no matter what we're taught. There's like this voice in our minds or a gut feeling that nags us and says that no, like what you're doing or what is being done to you is not okay. It's kind of like saying having a sixth sense. And that is what was happening to the children. Even though they were taught about incest and that having sexual acts with adults is normal. I'm pretty sure talking or even seeing how the other children at school interacted with their parents or teachers made them compare their own home environment and situation, how their own parents and aunts and uncles treated them and how different it was. Um, because one, one day, day, a girl named Sandra was acting out, per se, in class and the teacher had told her to leave. Now, when she was in the hallway, she was doing her best to keep it all in. She was hanging on by a thread. But then another teacher came by and asked her what was wrong and she started crying and she told the teacher that her father has been treating her like a wife. The teacher was shocked just like anyone would be having a young child come up to you and saying my father is treating me like a wife and she continued to say that he had been raping her 10 to 14 times a month since she was nine years old and that soon she was going to have his baby every other day since she was nine years old 
by her own father. Soon after, Child Protective Services and the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, got involved. Now, Sandra's father's name is William, and he lived with his wife, Wanda, and their three daughters in South Mountain in Nova Scotia. Now, William was described as being the head of the Goler family. He was uneducated, but not that slow as he was the one who came up with the plan on how to get the social welfare checks and he was responsible for telling the children what chores they had to do even if they weren't his own children. At first when the RCMP tried to question the rest of the children they were resistant because they were scared of the consequences from their family but slowly they opened up and started to share the gruesome life they endured. These children suffered sexual abuse from their fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, and even themselves. Sandra's little sister's testimony, Donna's testimony, is heartbreaking and it was key evidence in the trial. She said the first time she was raped when she was about to turn six years old. She remembers that clearly because she had just graduated from kindergarten, kindergarten and, and was, was about to go into grade one. And it was done by her father. If someone wanted to have sex with one of the children, William would let them for a case of beer or a carton of cigarettes or even a pack of cigarettes. They got to pick whichever child they wanted to have sex with. The children couldn't say anything. They weren't allowed to say anything or they would get punished. The children would line up against the wall and then the adult would come and choose the child they would want to have sex with and we would be forced to do it. Some children were even forced to watch while the adult and the child was having sex. I did read that many children over the years did try to ask for help, that it wasn't just Sandra and Donna speaking out first, but before, the town folk didn't believe them or they didn't take them seriously and they just decided to turn a blind eye. Basically, the town folk just created this division that like you guys are behind this wall we don't care about you and what you do because it's hard to imagine that we're taking children to a doctor's office or if some child is telling an adult that my aunt or uncle or father or mother is doing this to me that it wouldn't be taken seriously. It was more brushed off and the children were given back to their parents, the Goler clan, and the children were severely punished. The children were made an example for the rest of the family so the others wouldn't go and try to ask for help. But 14-year-old Sandra succeeded and found finally an adult that would listen to her and would try to help her. Now, during investigation, they discovered that the Goler family overall had very little education. Some of them barely had up to grade 3, and many were mentally disabled and or physically disabled, which was the result of generational incest. The Goler family at first denied everything the children said and, and claimed that Sandra was just trying to destroy their family that nothing they were doing was wrong and what they've been doing was happening for generations. The Goler family were born and raised to believe nothing else but how they were currently living. They were brainwashed into believing that this is how a regular family lives, that having sexual relationships with their children is normal and it's supposed to happen. And the relationship that William was having with his daughters, Sandra and Donna, was normal since it was also done to them as children and so on. And even went as far as saying that sometimes even the children were the ones initiating the sexual acts. Mind you, these children ranged from the ages of 5 and 14 years old. Later on, they did try to retract the statements, saying that they were nervous and pressured into saying what they've said. Now, a radio station was doing a segment on the family. Since the news was the talk of the town, they had interviewed one of the Goler adults, and he had said, what do you expect me to do when she comes on to you? Now, this is the man who was questioned for raping a 12-year-old. 
Soon after this interview, 16 children were taken from the Goler family and put into foster care. Now the townspeople had very different opinions. One have said that they were disgusting and should rot in jail forever, whereas the other half said that they were mentally ill and they don't know any better since they had low education and because of this they weren't doing anything wrong and should be put into an institution and get, and get help. During the investigation and the trial, the biggest thing that kept being brought up was the fact that they didn't know any better because they lacked education and were mentally unfit to know any better. In, In one of the interviews, Marie Goler was asked if she knew what incest was. She said yes, but what was happening in their family was not incest and that the 14-year-old Sandra was lying. The interviewer then asked Roy Hills, who was Marie's ex-husband, do you know what incest means? He replied, insects? And then when he was corrected, he replied, no. A lawyer from the Children's Aid Society did say the Goalers knew right from wrong and them not being educated and not knowing any better had to stop being an excuse for them. The reason he said that is because it came to light that the children were offered gifts for their silence or threatened to be beaten if they told anyone what they went through in the shacks. They also made the other children be lookouts while the adults were performing the sexual acts on the other children. Clearly, with the hiding, with the bribing, with the threatening, they knew right from wrong. They were forcing the kids to hide because they knew their actions were wrong. If we were to argue, oh, they didn't know any better, then why would you threaten the kids and bribe them? You would just carry on with your day and not give them gifts or have lookouts because you truly believed what you're doing is not wrong. Now, the Goler family ended up being released on a $500 bond and they were told they cannot have any contact with the children. Now, after they were released, something weird happened soon after. William Goler, who was the type of person that he himself would never go to church, nor would he let his children go to church or even Sunday school, now he and his wife started going to church with Bibles in hand, pretending to be a religious family man. The townspeople saw right through this facade and they knew he was pretending to show and say, look, I'm a good God-fearing Christian man. How could I ever do what you're accusing me of? William even got some of his family members to attend service just to prove to the public that they are a good, God-fearing family and they wouldn't do such acts that they're being accused of. Now, a pastor was interviewed after he went to the Goler family house to pray over Caesar Goler, who was paralyzed. He was asked what he thinks of the Goler family and the situation. The pastor said that he thinks everything could have been different if they were included in the community. If the townspeople invited them to participate in events and wished that the church reached out to them sooner. That with them being involved in the community, the sexual abuse would not have happened. Now I understand a church member, especially a pastor, is supposed to see the positive of a situation and be hopeful. But the adults knew what they were doing and they knew it was wrong. And the incest was happening for over 100 years. So they were set in their ways. If it hadn't been for the 14-year-old girl going up to the teacher and exposing them, they probably would still be in their shacks continuing on what they previously done. During trial, the defense thought and hoped the goalers would be institutionalized and have counseling. They argued that there was no need to put them in jail because they were not a threat to society and they were no longer a threat to their children since they would never see them again. However, the prosecutor insisted on heavy jail time and how counseling would not help them because the goalers believed what they were doing was not wrong. What's the point of counseling or helping someone who isn't ready to accept the help or be willing to hear someone out? 
At the end of the trial, they were found guilty and served jail sentences of one to seven years. Even after they served their sentences, some of the Golar adults just didn't understand why they went to jail. They didn't have like the mental capability of understanding that the reason they went to jail was because of the child jail. sexual abuse. And doctors say it is because of the generational incest affecting their brain development. Some people believe their sentences were not enough and they should have gotten much worse, whereas others believed that they should not have gotten any jail time because their children were taken away and that was punishment enough. I'm not talking just about people from the 1980s who lived in the next town over in Nova Scotia who actually knew of these people. I'm talking still to this day on forms while I was reading this case, people were arguing and stating their opinions. Why did the Golder clan go to jail? They should have been institutionalized. Like, I, I get it, they do need some help, but they clearly had some capability of understanding that what they're doing is wrong. You cannot expect me to believe that only the children knew what was happening was wrong. That is why the children would break down and try to talk to these adults, but the actual adults of the Golar clan didn't know what was going on and they totally believed 100% that what they're doing was completely normal. All the children were given counseling. They were recovering pretty well. However, the two oldest children had a hard time with their foster families. Some were adopted by local families as well. Now, the last name Goler became an insult and embarrassment for the children and most did end up changing their last names so they could leave this chapter behind them and move on. Many of the children, we don't know what happened to them or what's going on where they are in their lives. I'm hoping that they are happy wherever they are and they have moved on or are at least trying to move on, that their lives are much, much happier now. But Donna Geller went on to become an outspoken activist who has spoken at high schools and numerous conferences for stricter child abuse laws and for a stronger protection of children from convicted child molesters. To this day, Donna still goes around talking and trying to raise awareness. Now, what side of the fence are you on? Are the Guller adults to blame or was it purely the circumstances? I will put a link in the description below from an interview the Goler family did a very long time ago and the video is very choppy, the picture isn't clear, but you will get a sense of how they acted, the way they talked, they show even videos of their home inside, like you will see the actual family, it's a proper interview and how they lived and where they lived. Let me know what you think. Anyways. Thank you for watching this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any case suggestions, leave it down below and see you in my next video. Bye.